Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, Miss Kathleen Horine. I finally figured out how to pronounce it. (laughs) An honor graduate of Ball State University in Indiana with a BS in music education, Kathleen first taught music at McCullough Junior High School in Marion, Pennsylvania. No, Marion, Indiana. After relocating to Pennsylvania, Kathleen received her master's degree from Westchester University and taught music in the Central Dolphin School District, the School District of Lancaster, and Lancaster Country Day School in a total of 37 years. Kathleen, an oboist, performed with the Lancaster Symphony for 23 years. She's also performed as a regular member of the Harrisburg Symphony and York Symphony. Through the years, Kathleen has performed with the Allegro Chamber Orchestra, Lancaster and Reading Pops Orchestra, the Lancaster and Capital Woodwind Quintets, and the Fulton Theater and Opera Lancaster Pit Orchestras. She is a member of the National Association for Music Education, the Pennsylvania Music Educators Association, the Pennsylvania State Education Association, and the International Double Reed Society. She is also a member of Pi Kappa Lambda, of the National Music Honorary, Kappa Delta Phi, National Education Honorary, and Pi Lambda Theta, Women's Education Honorary. She has been listed in the national international Who's Who in Music, Who's Who of American Women, Who's Who in American Music, Classical Edition, and was nominated for Arts Educator of the Year in Lancaster County in 1993. Kathleen is currently serving as Adjunct Assistant Professor of Oboe, at Franklin and Marshall College. She was the director of the Intermezzo Woodwinds under the umbrella of Allegro's Next Gen Youth Music Organization. In 2018 to 2020, she was also a formal fa- former faculty member of the York Music Center Summer Camp and Strings Excel Music Camp. She is currently serving on the board of Lancaster slash York Musicians Union. Kathleen, Kathy, how are you doing today? Fine, thanks. Good. I'm curious. It's a, it's a long list of accolades and, and experience. What started it all for you as a child? Well, I started on clarinet. Everyone started on clarinet. And when I got to middle school, uh, junior high, we called it at that time, uh, they needed an oboist. Mm. And so my band director said, do you want to switch to the oboe? And I said, sure, I'll try it. So it was challenging because the oboe is difficult, and I just picked it up on my own. It just, he just gave me a book, and I learned how to play it. So um, I kind of learned how to play it. Eventually, my senior year of high school, I t- started taking private lessons, and then mm. I realized that I had a lot to learn. So was playing the clarinet, it was just something you, you did at that time, or something you just had to do, or was that something you wanted to do? It was something I wanted to do. Everyone wanted to be in the band at that point. This was in fifth grade okay. uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Where so, I'm from. Indianapolis, what a beautiful city. Yeah, very nice. Um, side, side quest aside, what are some of the challenges as, as a kid that you found through uh, playing the oboe as, a, as opposed to the clarinet? Um, it, I think it's the reeds. The reeds were always difficult, and being young and not taking lessons at that time, it was hard for me to know how to adjust them. Um, by the time you're in high school, you should be making your own oboe reeds, so that was difficult because I didn't have a teacher. So. so how does one make their own oboe reed? Well, you start, you start out with a staple and a piece of cane. Like and, sugar and, cane? And this is, it's cane that you find in the south of France, tube cane. So um, this is cane that's already been gouged and shaped. And then you fold it over the staple and you use your knife and you, and you make an oboe reed. And how long did this last? Uh, about a good read will last about nine to ten hours uh, at its optimum, you know, stage of playing. After that, uh, it kind of starts to go downhill, and you have to make some more. Why? Why is it that you have to make your own read and not you can't just buy it from the store like any other read? You can buy them from the okay. store, um, and it used to be that you just get those old plastic reads from the music store, and they were not very good. So most people want to really personalize their own reads so they learn to make their own. Nowadays, you can even get reads on Etsy. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. That's well, good. Uh, of, course, of course you could. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, you can get everything there. And you can also get oboe reads. So a lot of people now make them and sell them online. 
So you can buy them, uh, but most prefer to make their own. What are what are some of the technical challenges? Because I know oboe, you have to have a tight armature, and you have to have a lot of breath. Well, you do. You just have to learn how to breathe correctly. Mm. So I don't know if you need more breath than other for other instruments, but you just need to learn how to breathe. And when you're playing the oboe, you'll have to breathe, but you're playing through such a small opening that not all the air goes through. So sometimes mm. when you feel like you need to take a breath, you need to exhale the old air first and then inhale. Really? Yeah. Is there circular breathing on an oboe? There is. There is. I oh have goodness. not. I've tried it. I'm not very good at it. But other oboes, yes, definitely. If for, for those who don't know, circular breathing is when you're, uh, while you're pushing out air, you breathe in through your nose, right? Yeah, yes, and store it. Store and, it. Yeah. it. It's, it's uh, honestly, it's magic. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yes. So uh, from high school, where did you go with your oboe? Well, um, when I decided to go to college, which was Ball State, which was fairly close to Indianapolis, uh, I was not going to major in music mm. because I'd only taken an oboe. I loved oboe. I loved music all through high school. But I felt I wasn't very good only taking private lessons that one year. And I took from Warren Sutherland from the Indianapolis Symphony. And I had a lot of things to fix. Why do I know that name? I don't know. I don't even know if he's still around. I know he's not still playing in the Indianapolis Symphony. But, um, so uh, I decided that I was going to major or just in general studies at college. And when I went up for a tour at my college, the person who was leading the tour said, you know, if you're going to minor in music, you might as well just major in music because it's such a time-consuming major. So I switched, and I go, okay, I'll major in music. So that was it. And, of course, glad that I, I did make that decision. What are some of the most valuable experiences that you had during your college career at that point? Um, well, we had a good, uh, Muncie Symphony was also a good orchestra that I performed in. Uh, I got a chance to play English horn in that as well as oboe. And you know what the English yeah. horn is, yeah, cousin of the oboe. Um, so I, I just had a lot of opportunities to perform, and um, it was exciting. And uh, after college, you made the move to Pennsylvania. Yes. I taught one year in Indiana, and then my husband at the time got in a show band out here on the East Coast. A show band? Yes. He played with the Bobby Mercer Road Show. That's way before your time. And we moved to Pennsylvania. So what was that, what was that move like? What Was there, uh, certainly there was more opportunity around Lancaster, um, do you think? Yes, as opposed to what? As the, opposed to Indiana? Indiana? I guess, again, because I was from Indianapolis, that's a big right, town, course. so there was options there. Um, Lancaster, yes, there's a lot of, uh, almost every town had their own symphony orchestra. So I auditioned and got into the Lancaster Symphony and played with them for many, many years. Um, after living here, then I started teaching school. I got a teaching job also. Um, first one was in Central Dolphin School District in the Harrisburg area. And then I got in the Harrisburg Symphony. And then I joined the York Symphony. So at one time, I was in all three orchestras. That's crazy. Yeah. How does, from a teacher's perspective, what are some of the most important things that a, a teacher should have under the belt in regards to teaching children? I think they should also be a good musician. Mm. Um, I, don't, it, I know you have to have a good rapport with children, but also you just have to be a good musician and know how to get your musical ideas across to the students. What do you think are some of the challenges when it comes to teaching? Uh, not enough time and, <laughs> and scheduling. Scheduling often. It depended. Uh, when I was in the school district of Lancaster, it was hard to get it scheduled in, and sometimes we'd have to have rehearsals before or after school mm. or during recess, which was well, not always not popular. Nope. Yeah. Uh, how did you manage being uh, a, not only a teacher, but then also in these different orchestras at the same time, and then having a personal life? How do you balance all of that? It was very difficult. I look back now, and I don't know how I, how I did it, because of playing all the time in the evening. I also had private students teaching school. And then, of course, once I had my own children, um, then it was, I was busy. <laughs> yeah. You're very, very busy. <laughs> very busy. <laughs> I'm curious, what are some of the most memorable experiences you've had playing with the, those orchestras? Well, um, it, all three of them were wonderful and different experiences with all three. 
uh, playing with Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, when we, I was in York Symphony, that was uh, quite an experience. And um, I've played with other big names, Van Cliburn and Andre Watts. I think when you get a famous soloist like that, you just play your best. So I think that that was always um, a lot of fun and real inspiring. Did you ever get to talk to them, or was it more of just a professional? I, I was kind of afraid to talk to them, so <laughs> I would just admire admire them from afar. I generally did not go up and speak to them. No, that's very fair. It's it's hard to when, whenever like a, a big person like that comes up, it's easy to be like they're they're untouchable. In in awe, you're in awe of them. Yeah. Yes, and and you're just so excited to be there. So. So tell me, you've also been a part of all of these incredible music education uh, associations, and uh, what is it like to be a member of those? What what is what is your role in that? How does that all work? Well, um, I generally attended the state conferences just because I enjoyed going, listening to musicians, going to master classes, and so forth. You always learn, and you always want to keep learning. You know, when you're a teacher. So I think that was the best part of being a member of those organizations. And then um, the International Double Reed Society, that was apart from teaching, but I just attended the International Double Reed Society conference. It was in Boulder, Colorado. That was two weeks ago. Oh, wow. And that was oboists from all over the world. So again, you're learning things, always learning. So, so is it just like a, a collection of master classes in a weekend? Or it a was week? a week-long week conference. Long. Mm -hmm. It was mostly, this time, mostly uh, performances. Mm. And it was interesting because it was a lot of women composers and a lot of living composers. So <laughs> that's very different. And it, I think I see things changing all over. The orchestras now are starting to perform works by women composers, more women composers. There are, women composers are out there, mm -hmm. but they just weren't always presented or performed. Yeah. So that was a lot of that at this conference, and that was really fun. And not to mention uh, performing by living, actual living composers, because that's that tends to be a, a not done thing as well. Exactly, yeah. And again, a lot of the composers were out at this conference to hear their works. So a lot of living that's composers. That's incredible. Yeah, it was it was great. So you've also been a part of Allegro and uh, Reading a Reading Pops Orchestra. Tell me about uh, tell me about those experiences. Well, Allegro, I'm still performing in Allegro, and in fact, we have a concert tomorrow evening, So, um, and that's at the Gardner Center, uh, the new theater there on Lancaster Country Day School's uh, campus. So Allegro is performing tomorrow night, and we're doing Mahler's Fourth, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, so that is tomorrow evening. We have another rehearsal tonight. So still performing with that group, so that's that's a lot of fun. I generally play second oboe in that. That's... And that's one of the uh, more professional or chamber orchestras in the area, right? Yes, definitely. What is it like to work with some of those high-class, top-notch musicians? Well, you make sure that you're top-notch, too. You make right, sure that you're prepared on your music and that you've got a good read and that you're ready to play. It's, it's mind-boggling to me because I, I oftentimes I forget that a lot of the practice happens not together, right? It's a lot of rehearsal at home. It's a lot of it's a lot of preparation outside of the because you know in band class, you, if you were uh, smart about it, you would perform at home, right? At home, practice at home, yes. But a, a lot of a, a lot of the time, you would be there practice at the practice instead of instead of you know practicing at home. Well, students, yeah, I, I've noticed that for all the years of school teaching, that often they would just expect to learn it there at school. They didn't always get the practice in at home. But for Allegro and for the other orchestras, you, you pretty much have to learn your part. And Brian Norcross will send out um, metronome markings so that to know exactly what metronome marking oh, wow. or what tempo you should be playing the music. So, and, and you mark that in all your music and then you practice it. You can also listen to it. Of course, YouTube has everything now where you can listen ahead of time. What happens when something goes wrong, like a reed breaks or a part of your instrument? Uh, well, I'd assume that's rare, but has it ever happened to you, and what do you do? Um, my oboe has never broken. Uh, sometimes I'm not always happy with my reeds, so I always have a spare. Sometimes you'll have one reed for the first half of the concert and a different reed for the second half. Mm. Um, but I, 
sometimes with oboes, you'll have the, uh, I'm not sure why oboes tend to get this, but they get water in the hole underneath the key. So you'll be playing along and playing something beautifully, and all of a sudden, gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. <laughs> There's a little bit of water in it. So that's an issue with us. So we always have our feather. You know, with oboes, you use a feather to swab out. So we'll quickly feather and swab that water out. So that's one of the main problems, just uh, keeping up on not letting that water get into your tone holes. I wonder, I guess it's condensation, that's what it would be. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I guess that's unavoidable. It is, yeah. That's unfortunate. So you just have to swab out every time you have a break. And hopefully uh, nobody does it at the same time. <laughs> right, right, right. So, But I've never had noble break on that, so that, that would be devastating. Yeah, that would be devastating. Yeah. Um, what was it like to be uh, enlisted in the international who's who? How does how does that work? Or is it just, oh, I'm in this? That's cool. You just get an email asking, and I think really they get your name from somewhere. And at this point, this was years ago. I They wouldn't now ask me that because, you know, I'm kind of semi-retired from performing. But this was years ago when I was playing, so they must just get a list of names, and they send an invitation. And I think it's really to sell sell their books because then you can buy the book too mm -hmm. but still it's nice and an honor so what do you think is the most challenging aspect to today for for classical musicians for uh oboists in today's world um i don't know i guess i, I think in this area classical music is still i think thriving there's Very a lot so. of local orchestras, a lot of chances for people to play. I guess for an oboist, the tricky part would be most orchestras just have two oboists. So mm -hmm. it's not like if you're a violinist and you can come in because there's a whole, a whole million crowd of them. Yep. Yeah. So for us, it's two. So if there are two people in that orchestra, then how are you going to get in, you know, unless one of them retires or, or moves? So I guess it's a lot of, it would be a lot of networking. Yes. Yeah. And especially because if there's, there's so few oboists. You are, and you, in you yourself mentioned that you are a part of many different orchestras mm -hmm. as well. Yes. So how how do you navigate? Uh, oh, she plays in this orchestra and this orchestra. Where am I gonna fit in? Not only to mention the skill level, like if a young oboist, she's they are probably gonna have to do a lot of work, a lot of work to even be considered. Yeah, yeah. And they open up auditions when something somebody moves away or retires or whatever. They'll open up auditions. But again, even for some of the regional orchestras, which aren't really full-time orchestras, um, there might be 80, 90 people come to audition. That's how many good musicians are out there that just want to play. What do you think is some of the most challenging pieces that you've ever played? Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe. I didn't even have to think. And the conductors will often say, well, they just, they just want you to go blah, 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 And that's pretty much what you have to do. It goes so fast, and it's so technical. It's very difficult. This is a bunch of arpeggios and, and scales? It, yeah, yeah. And and that's he he wanted an effect. That's what they always say. They just want an effect, so do your best. That, that, that is true. Uh, whenever, whenever I listen to, to uh, film score or, or whatever, like something – something epic or uh it's always just it's it's it, it's written out but it's not supposed to be played exactly it's just for the effect of the right. li 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 yeah. li li just to be mind-boggling or epic and yes. or like as a uh behind the behind the whatever behind the the main piece i'm i'm forgetting all my okay. I should know. I should know my terminology. I'm a I'm a composition major. <laughs> yeah, <you should. laughs> I should. Uh, behind the main theme, it, it's right. it's it's a uh, texture, behind right. color behind right. the main theme. Yeah. So that that was difficult. Yeah. What do you think is one of your favorite pieces to play? Oh my gosh, um, Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra was always one of my favorites. Why? Um, it's just a cool piece. It's not an old-fashioned, old, old piece from years, hundreds of years ago, but yet it's also got a lot of melody um, to it, and it's just a beautiful piece. What do you think makes a good oboe piece? Um, something that doesn't go down to low B-flat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, there have been a lot, and I think most composers that write for the oboe know our best range. Mm. Um, we have kind of a small range compared to some of the other instruments. Very much so. So, yeah. Um, and low B flat is our lowest note, but sometimes it's a little tricky to get out. It, for any composers out there, even though if a note is possible, doesn't mean it should be done. That's right, yeah. <laughs> I've, lear I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Have you written for the oboe? Uh, I have attempted to write for most of every instrument, and uh, I, I, wrote, I once wrote a symphony with an oboe, and some of the, some of the some of the some of the people in the Rachel side about them. Uh, was, <laughs> was, I was like, Corey, this is not possible, yeah. and I'm like, well, I'm, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you learn. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a learning process, and uh, I kind of want to learn the oboe. Uh, a goal of mine is to learn most of, not most, but a basic. Uh, Basic understanding of every instrument, so that way I can at least understand. Okay, this is po something that's possible. Is this doable though? Because uh, possible and doable are completely different things in the in the realm of composition. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so learning that I feel like is something I'd I'd have to do. Uh, you're also a part of a union. Of two yes, years. the Lancaster York they have merged the last few years, so Lancaster and York Musicians Union. Yes. Tell me about that. What what do they do, and and how that works? I think they're here just to support the musicians. And um, a few years ago, Lancaster Symphony went union, so now the members are union members. Um, I think it's just more for support for the musicians, also wage scale for the musicians. That makes a difference too, so that they're not paying the musicians of a measly amount of money. So, and how does one get involved in that? Or, well, they just asked me because if they couldn't find anyone else to serve on the board, I think. <laughs> but I enjoy it. I, I like knowing all the the background things that happen with the union and the musicians. Well, I, well how do people join that though? Like, oh, how do they join, join the, the yeah, union. Join the union. Um, I think you could just Google that, and it's local two ninety four. Okay. So we'd love to have more members. We really would. And we do have a good an amount of musicians that are members in Lancaster County and in York County. But um, there's always room for more. So, yes, local 294, and Google it, and then there's a place there to join. And does that cover only classical musicians? Does that cover pit orchestras? Anything. Anything. Any pit, jazz. Um, we have a lot of just band members. Really? Um, just like yes. bar gigging band members? Anything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, that's really versatile. That's, yes. that's, that's for any of those uh, many gig musicians, because <laughs> <laughs> that's important. There's a lot of there's a lot of bars that will undercut you, and you don't even know it. Right. Uh, but again, if the bar yeah. is not going by union rules, if they're not union, of then, course, yeah, right. They, then they still don't have to pay. So, so I guess what what's the uh, what's what's the secret then? Do they have to go to? Uh, are there bars that are under union? I'm not sh I'm, that I'm not sure. And I'm thinking some of the musicians that we have that do play in bars also play classical. So mm -hmm. they may be in the union for that, and then you know, it can spread over into their other gigs. Gotcha. Hmm. What was it like to play in, the, in some of the pit orchestras that you played with? That's been fun. That's been fun. I played for the Fulton for many years. Uh, when they use oboe, they don't always. Not all the um, instrumentation for the shows use Fire oboe. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I played for many of the shows, both runs of Les Mis that they did at the Fulton. So it's uh, it's fun and and enjoyable. What are some of the challenges that come with playing pit orchestra as opposed to playing chamber orchestra? Well, I think for pit orchestra, mostly it's just at least at the Fulton when I was playing there before I retired from that, um, eight shows a week. So the challenge for that is just eight shows a week. Eight shows a week. And again, with your reads that last nine to ten hours, you're, you're constant, constantly, making, constantly new making new reads, yeah, to play the shows. So um, that was the challenge for that. But the Fulton is great for that in the pit, and they have um, every instrument is miked. So that's nice. So you don't feel like you – and they have someone adjusting that. So the sound that comes out is quite good. You know, they can turn you down if you're a little too loud or bring you up. Well, that's cool. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry too much about your own dynamics. You can just play. And play and the dynamics that are written. That are written. And, and, yeah. And then they can mix whatever, they, whatever is needed. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, that was fun. 
It was fun. But eight shows a week, that was a lot. So I Plus Tech Week. Do you have to yeah. play for Tech Week? Um, we play for the last couple rehearsals before okay. it starts. Gotcha. I know Tech Week is when everything's crazy. Yeah. Uh, what are you most excited for in the, in the future in regards to your career? Well, I still want to play, even though I've retired from you know some of the orchestras and so forth. So I still enjoy playing. Um, I still enjoy private teaching. So I do have a, a studio of private oboe students too, and that's that's fun. That's fun. I love the little fourth grader that comes in with the oboe, and sometimes I almost think fourth grade is a little early to start oboe because it's such a difficult so. instrument. So I do get changeovers. A lot of the band directors will start them on another instrument lute or clarinet, and then in middle school, we'll switch them over when they're a little more mature. Why do you think it's it's always a progression from like flute or clarinet to oboe? I, I've often wondered about that, too, because flute doesn't use yeah, flute a reed. Doesn't at all. And clarinet, the embouchure, is very different, very different than the oboe's embouchure, so I'm not exactly sure. I guess they're figuring if maybe the, this person is interested in woodwinds, so... Well, what uh, embouchure would you most compare it to, do you think? Uh, the oboe one. The oboe one yeah. Well, we have uh, both lips fold over. Right. Although you don't want to full roar too much. Mm -hmm. um, and clarinet, of course, the teeth rest on the top of the mouthpiece, so it's a little different. I, I've tried to play oboe once. <laughs> Only once. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your sound like that you got? I got squeaks. Squeaks and uh, not sounds. Oh, okay. It's just a bunch of air flowing through because it, it, it's such a. I can barely play the flute as well. And uh, cl granted, flute, like you said, completely different armature, completely different uh, goal that you're trying to do with your mouth. Right. Uh, and clarinet, I can get clarinet. I'm pretty good at clarinet. It's the old, but it's it's the oboe and the bassoon. The bassoon is also a, a crazy instrument to me as well, because you have to you have to you know. To, Curl, curl both of your lips at such a intensity, but not too intense. But right, because then you cut off the sound. The reed closes up, and then you can't get anything. Else. It's it's very precise, and yeah. and it's it's it takes years of practice. And for someone who gets frustrated very easily, <laughs> it's it's not worth my time. Uh, well, and it I, could have been the reed too, because maybe, sometimes yeah. the bought reeds that you will get at a music store are not the best, mm. and almost unplayable sometimes so if a student does get a read at a store often i'll have to adjust it and to make it playable for them yeah and it's there's so many things you're going to worry about uh i feel like with an oboe you have to worry about the tightening of uh, like setting the read uh, i don't know what the technical term for that is uh would it be setting like screwing in the, the read making sure it's all nice and tight uh you mean okay i'm not sure what you mean say that again uh putting the read in Oh, just sticking it in the yeah, top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And making sure that it's all in okay. the right place. Well, it pretty much, you push it in, it stops. Oh, okay. It, you can't, yeah. Now, you can pull it out, but when you push it in, there's a, a, a stopping place there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I never... Yeah. I don't know. There's stuff I don't know about. It. That's okay. <laughs> that you're learning. Yeah, you're learning. So, But now, we occasionally will pull out, but generally, they don't like for you to pull out because the oboe is a conical instrument. Clarinet is cylindrical. It goes straight up. The oboe is conical. Mm -hmm. So if you pull that reed out, like if you're sharp and you think, oh, I better pull it out to make it flatter, you're destroying the conical proportions. So how do you tune an oboe? Well, you just make a reed that plays in tune. Oh, yeah. oh that must be maddening. <laughs> it is, because occasionally you'll get it. But you can adjust the reed. Like if a reed's a little sharp, there's places to scrape on it that will make it a little lower and make it a little flatter. You have to be a carpenter and a musician. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. How how much do you have of that cane stocked up for? Because uh, surely you just don't buy it. Oh, like oh, I'm I'm running out of. I, surely you buy stocks. You buy it, it in, in yeah. bulk. When I was at the IDRS conference, they had all kinds of places where you could buy tube cane because people some people buy it still in tubes and then they gouge it and shape it. You could buy just gouged cane, you could buy just shaped cane. So they had plenty of places where you can buy it. And you do buy it in bulk because you do make so many reeds. And it's only in France, southern France you can get it? That's the best cane. And they've okay. experimented around the world and, and saying, well, now this cane is 
uh, now they've started growing this in Arizona or something like that. I can't remember now where someplace in the United States they tried growing cane, this specific kind of cane. Um, but the south of France is the best, That's, generally. That makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, so that it comes over from there, and then you order it from a reed place here in the United States. Do you know uh, the history of the elbow at all? A little bit. Um, the Baroque oboes look very different from oh, our modern that. oboes. Yeah, they don't have all the keys and made it from a different kind of wood. Was it? Did it originate in France? Do you, do you know? Well, the originally you see Hautboy, H A U T B O I S. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe. they're not. From, yeah, there are so many double reed instruments. When I was in Morocco visiting, um, out in the really? in the um, marketplace. There were people playing the old, they were oboes, they had a double reed, but it was on an old ancient instrument. I didn't even know what the name of it was called. So um, it, for all the countries, have some kind of old double reed instrument. What do you think is the most in uh, interesting instrument that you have, uh, have you ever attempted to play one of those? I've attempted a Baroque oboe. The really old, old ones that just have a few holes, um, like that I saw in Morocco, I have not tried those. Would you Would you be willing to? I, I would. I would love to try one sometime. I don't even know where to get one. but that's It's something I've always, like, it, um, whenever I'm up in New York City and I go to Central Park, you can find a, a, an abundance of crazy musicians yeah. with music stuff there. Uh, they had... Uh, a sitar, and um, there was there was one instrument where uh, the, you, it was there was reeds on both sides that would uh, that would play music, and, and it was, you held it like this, and you just blew into it, and it sounded like almost like an organ, but yeah. a, a wind instrument organ. It's something I've always wanted to try because it, it's it was it was so crazy. There's some crazy instruments out there. Uh, have you ever heard of the oud? I have heard of that. Yeah, isn't it O-U-D? O-U-D, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's St. James Presbyterian Church uh, down in Lancaster that uh, every Friday or every Friday or Saturday, they uh, they play the oud as, as some of the, it's one of the most ancient instruments, the guitar instruments or uh, string instruments, I should say, yeah. uh, out there. And it's crazy, the tunes to think about back in the Middle, mid, mid, mid age, middle Ages, uh, what music was because you know stuff of the Beethoven and the Bach didn't sound like it does today no no because they would have had different instruments and different kinds of reeds and, and different you know. tunings they, yeah maybe not even a equals 440 right uh, or 442 if you're from Europe <laughs> yeah right yes <laughs> <laughs> that's true so I'm curious what what is you, you mentioned Allegro this Friday. What are some other events that you're excited for coming up? Well, my Woodwind Quintet, the Lancaster Woodwind Quintet, which I still perform with, is performing next Friday, the 19th of August, downtown. Downtown. You know how they have the Brown Bag Series? I don't know if you've ever attended that. Yeah, every Friday uh, they'll have a musical group, and that's generally a union thing where you pretty much have to be a union member for that. And uh, then people that are down for market and lunch Come and listen. So it's not like a first Friday thing. It's just like an every Friday thing. It's a Friday thing oh, during the summer. Yeah, during just the summer. during the summer because it's outside and it's right there on the on the square. Okay. So like I'm on gonna, that on that podium there. Yeah, they have that little gazebo thing. Yeah. There, it's near the gazebo. Yeah, right in front of. I think it's Fulton Bank, maybe. Yes, uh, like right by the Marriott. Yes, yeah, right yeah, yeah, across yeah. the street from the Marriott. Yeah, so my woodwind quintet is performing, and we've performed together for so many years that pretty much we just pick our music, go, and play. We do. Really? We are going to have a little quick rehearsal before the uh, performance, but the 19th from 12 to 1 on the square should be fun. How long does it take uh, a person to get up to that skill level where, uh, or what are some of the tips and tricks or maybe uh, some might call it hacks that you can get to, to get to that level? Of course it's time, but what are some of the 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 neat little tricks that you that you do to learn music quicker? Oh, let me think. Um, I think it's just from the years of practice. You just kind of know what you need to do. You can look at a piece and look at the tempo and know, okay, this is the section I need to practice. If you see a section where you've got all whole notes, 
obviously you don't need to of spend as much time on that. So I think it's just from the years of practice that we've all been playing. That's fair enough. I, I for me, it some some tips or tricks. I, I like to look at things in phrases or uh, passages. Makes it way easier to okay. I know this is obviously a passage. It, it's a, clearly an A, and then here's a B, right? Right. And then I, I practice those in succession. Uh, and if I realize I need to work on something, I just repeat that over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, do you have you ever had to you know start slow and then build it back up to speed? That's a good way to do it. Also, I was always told growing up when I was a kid, practice something in a different rhythm. And then bring it back to the rhythm that's on the page. Not really? sure why. I'm not, why that would be, why useful. that was always suggested. But um, I think people still do that today too. You find it useful? A, a little bit, yeah. And also just starting slow and building up, working with the metronome. I'm a big person working with the metronome. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I hate working with the metronome. <laughs> but it's necessary. It's, it is it's necessary. Absolutely yeah. necessary. And it. One of the things, if you're a musician, uh, that you have to build is discipline. Yes. Because yeah. you're going to get mad. You're going to want to throw your instrument across the room. Right. Well, many times. Or your reads. Or yeah. your read. Yeah. Or yourself. Yeah, right. So, yeah, you do have to be disciplined and, and make sure that you're practicing and prepared. And make sure you schedule your practices as well. It's mm -hmm. not, oh, I have some free time. I'll do this. Yeah. No, because if you don't schedule it in your practice, you're not going to practice. Right. Right. And I think some people practice hours and hours a day. And get um, nothing done. Yeah. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. But some of the performances at this IDRS conference two weeks ago, um, Catherine Needleman was one. She's the first oboist in the Baltimore Symphony. And she played a piece that was maybe 20, 25 minutes long, all from memory. Oh, so you gosh. can imagine. And um, oh, what is his name? Another. Some of the other performers did the same. Some brought their... Their music stands out with music, and some of the others, some of the big names, just perform totally from memory and for 20, 25 minutes. It, uh, so you can imagine that what I'm saying that for is because you can imagine the time that they had to put in. To do that, yeah. I can't imagine spending that much time on a piece that I would memorize it for 20 minutes. That's, that's, how many pages would that be? That's, that's, yeah. That's like, more than 20 pages, at least. Well, again, with the solo, and you've got some um, uh, orchestral accompaniments, so mm. you're not always playing nonstop. But, gotcha. uh, but still, that's still it's a It's a sizable lot. task. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I would be, if anyone said, hey, go up there, play this music, you have maybe uh, one week to practice it. I'm not learning that piece. I'm not yeah. memorizing the piece. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, for one week, that would be tricky, but... But there were many that did play from memory, so we heard some marvelous um, performers. What do you think is the future of classical music? I think in certain areas, like around here, I, th I think it's thriving at times. Um, I know that there are, sometimes you'll see in our um, international musician where they post about auditions for the major orchestras, they'll occasionally have uh, articles about an orchestra that's having trouble money-wise. Mm. So I know that there are orchestras in the United States that probably are struggling. But I, I think around here, uh, classical music is supported. Have, have you ever found that being a woman has been challenge, ever been a problem for you? Like, have you ever been... I No. No? No. So, no. I don't think so. That's good. Or maybe I didn't know it was a problem. and But, uh, yeah, I, I've never encountered anything like that, I don't think. That's good. Yeah, because well, we we mentioned the 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 women composers get a better because they're they're not called composers first off they're called women for female composers. Yes, right? yeah, good point. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, that was always the conversation in in school. It's like, oh, this is a female composer. Well, we don't call male composers male composers, right? We just yeah. call them oh, they're composers. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, and you know, mu classical music being a male dominated world. Yeah. Pr pr uh, pr primarily. Uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad you never received any. I yeah I don't I don't think so. Um, maybe if I had played tuba or something like that, then maybe. Maybe yeah. The tuba is a giant instrument. Right <laughs> right. So yeah, but uh, no, not really. 
but but I agree with you as far as the composer thing too, and and that is changing. Like I said two weeks ago, we heard all kinds of women composers and ones that I'd never heard of. I should have heard of them, but nobody performs their work. So, if you can recommend at least three women composers to listen to, who would they be? Well, Ruth Gibbs, Alyssa Morris. Also, I've heard of her. Yes. Um, Richter, I can't think of her first name, mm. but I see H T E R. So those are are three. That a uh, current current composers. Uh, current yeah. composers, yeah. okay. Because I uh, past composers, the only the only one I can really think of is Mozart's sister. Uh, right, right. And again, it just goes to show that I I ref- referred to her as Mozart's the sister, sister <laughs> instead of yes. <laughs> and I can't name. think of her name right now, but yeah, right, exactly. Oops. <laughs> um, and there's there's another one that I that I I remember playing the music of, but I can't remember her name for the life of me. Uh, I think that will change. Like I said, I think the orchestras yeah. are starting to perform more um, composers who are women. I don't want to say women composers, right? Who so, um, to be women. so I think we'll become more familiar with their names. And I I really I really do enjoy the push for playing uh, living composer music instead of the old. Uh, old guard, as, yes. as it were. Granted, it is beautiful and amazing stuff. I, I one of my uh, bucket list items is to hear the Fifth Symphony, Mahler's uh, or Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, and uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, in uh, by some of the world class mus- musics because I just love those symphonies. Yes, I've uh, I've played all those. Yeah, one time or another through the years. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is your favorite old guard? Uh, Besides bar talk, what do you think is one of your your favorites? Well, I like music from the Baroque, and I think that is mostly because I play the oboe, and there was so much music written for the oboe at that time. Uh, as far as solos, the Romantic period is really where there were not very many solos written for the oboe. Hmm. There, there were some. I'm not saying there weren't any, but um, not as many as maybe during the uh, Baroque and classical. I wonder period. why. Yeah, I'm not sure. It was featured a lot in the Romantic period in orchestral music. I'm just saying solos, not as many. Hmm. I wonder why. That's yeah. A, this is the questions that I like to ponder on. So you said you started your own court, uh, quintet? Well, this Lancaster Woodwind Quintet has been together for I don't know how many year, years, and okay. years and years and um, years. 25, 30 years we've gotten together and we've changed um, – personnel at times but it's always stuck together and we and we don't play a lot but uh, we still enjoy getting together and performing have you ever wanted wanted to start your own project of of uh, musicians uh you mean getting together like a, getting uh, together specific, a like a chamber group or, yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that not really uh, because i've always just been so busy i think just the groups that i play in are are enough Fair for enough. me at this point because really i consider myself more a music teacher, a school teacher who played on the side. Mm. Even though I did a lot of playing, um, I always considered my teaching as my important career. So what do you, what is your philosophy of teaching? Um, I like to give a lot of responsibility to the student. I try not to be just do it this way, do it this way, do it that way. So, um, and just be very encouraging. What are some of the challenges that students would give you uh, and how do you navigate those? I have had students, now again, this we're thinking oboe and beginning oboist. Um, my dad won't let me play, won't let me practice because he's trying to watch TV. So I, I always hate to hear that mm-hmm. because I always like it when they'll say, well, my mom wanted to hear me play this, and that's the best. Of course. When, when parents encourage it. It, and it seems weird to me when, whenever that happens because first off, you know, the kids aren't paying for it, right? Right. And so uh, it, it always that always knocks me weird when it's like, okay, but you're paying for your child to do this, and then you're like, well, I, I'm trying to watch the, yeah, for, trying to watch TV. It's like put put in some headphones, you know? What I'm yeah. Right. It's, That's how I I feel too. Yeah. So that doesn't happen a lot. I I find my parents are very. Um, encouraging yeah, for the most part so. and supportive yes but every once in a while I, I hear I hear that so and I think too the kids today are very busy mm. I think when I was a kid we didn't have so many activities that we were in so I think that it hurts a little bit 
um, that they were doing this, 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 and this, and this sport, and this sport, and it just limits their time for practice. What do you think are some of the benefits of playing oboe? It's, it's just the most beautiful instrument in the world. That's fair enough. Yeah. And it's one of the rare instruments, so you could probably get some scholarship for, for playing yes, that well. Yes, yes. And I will have um, my oboe students that are seniors in high school, even if they're not going to major in music, they still want to continue to play their oboe. And most of the colleges have bands and orchestras for anybody that wants to play and will give money. If they're, because oboists are always um, rare, so they will offer scholarships even to non-majors. Wow, really? Just to play in their group. Not full scholarships, of course, but of course. yeah. But a scholarship yep. is a scholarship. Yeah, any money helps. Any money. Um, and you, you work at Frank and Marshall. Yes, I'm an adjunct, adjunct. Uh, as, yeah, professor there. Yeah, so I'm only there day, day and a half. What do you think are some mistakes that students make uh, when learning an instrument like oboe or otherwise? Um, I think they make the mistake of thinking it's going to be easy and that they don't have to put the work behind it. For a, a college student, what is, the, what is your recommended hour, hourage per week of practice? That's hard because at F&M, um, I have a lot of at oboe students, but they're generally a different major. And they might be pre-med, and they are mm. having science classes with three-hour labs. So um, whatever they can get in for my college students. And they've all been, if you're an oboist and you're still playing at that age, you're a pretty responsible person. Um, yeah, you've, right. you've, learned, you've learned to be if you're an oboist. So most of them just find time when they can. And I don't say you have to practice an hour a day or anything. What do you? Uh, how about for those dedicated oboe oboe uh, major musicians? Then it's a little different. They need to, to do the read work. They need to do the practicing. Um, if you can get in an hour a day, again, remember they've got other classes course, too yeah. that they're taking. So uh, at least an hour a day. At least, an, yeah, that yeah. was that, that's what it was here at LBC. Was at the practice seven hours a week. Doesn't matter when you get those seven hours in. Right. But it's that should be seven. the minimum. Yeah. Minimum at least. Yeah. Uh, more if, if you want to get better. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've also been, uh, you've, you're a member of these Pi Kappa Lambda, uh, Kappa Delta Pi. What was it like to get into those, or, or how did you get into those? I think, again, just because I was very active in college, I think just I got the invitation. So, Do you recommend people to get into, uh, I guess, the sororities? I think it it's a good thing to be in those because it shows that you've put some work behind your major and what you've been doing for four years. Um, I'm not so sure I use them anymore, hmm. but um, I, I think those organizations still exist, but I'm not an active member anymore of those. So, I'm unfamiliar with sororities. What are their purposes? Well, you mean um, there are sororities that are professional, like Sigma Alpha Iota was a women's, it was actually it was called a women's music fraternity. Mm. Um, so there, then you're really doing a lot of musical things. But then there's also the social um, sororities. Too. Gotcha. So, so uh, these sororities were more of the, those, edu those uh, academic. Oh, yes, yes. Those, so. These were not, so. yeah, these weren't okay. social at all. Yeah. So it, it's, so those are good resume. Uh Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. It shows you put some work in. Right, of course, because you yeah. have to, you know, be invited to those. You can't exactly. Just, you, yeah. you, don't, you don't apply to them, do, do you? No, no I yeah, never right. applied to them. I would just get um, an invitation for that. Same thing with that Arts Educator of the Year. That was when I was still teaching in the school district of Lancaster. And um, I, I didn't win, but I, w <laughs> I was nominated for that. And it was a very nice uh, ceremony that we went to, so. What do you think are some of the mistakes that maybe you have made as an educator, as a player, and how can we uh, prevent that for the future generations of musicians and teachers? I think it's spreading yourself too thin. You know, as we talked about earlier, um, I was at kids, I was teaching school, I was playing my oboe. Sometimes I just felt spread too thin. Mm. So maybe a suggestion would be just focus maybe a little more on, on one area. What is something you wish you knew before? Or what is something that you know now that you wish you had known before? 
in regards to music, oboe, education? As much as I love the oboe and it's a beautiful instrument, I, I wish, wish I would have known before about the remaking and just the amount of time that it would take. How much time does, does it take to... Well, um, there's a lot of, again, remaking yeah. takes a lot, and the professionals are, are pretty much spending every day, you know, a couple hours with, with reeds and, and practicing. So um, I think I would still take the oboe, but uh, go in with my eyes open to know <laughs> that it was just going to be it was a lot of work. How, so then how do you balance your work, your playing, and then uh, your personal life? Um, at, years ago, it was tough because I was teaching school full time. Now, because I'm retired from school teaching, it, it's not so bad. I can get up and I can practice or work on reads or do what I need to do before a rehearsal in the evening. Balancing it years ago when I was playing, still playing in Lancaster Symphony, Harrisburg Symphony I only played in for eight years. Mm. Um, when I left Central Dauphin, um, I, I thought that's a lot of traveling up from Lancaster to Harrisburg. I was teaching full time. I had just had my first child. And that's when I um, resigned in good standing from Harrisburg because it was just a little much. It, that was a lot. So I only played in Harrisburg for eight years. Did you ever get into conducting or directing or? Well, the intermezzo wins, yes. I did that. Well, of course, I had to at school because I was course, a band right. director. But um, just a few years ago, um, I, under the umbrella of that Next Gen Youth Symphony, I conducted the intermezzo wins, which is a middle school band for two years. And, and I really loved that. That was kids from all over the county. What, what are some of your favorite pieces that you've conducted? Oh, my gosh. Uh, there was a nice arrangement of some of the movements of pictures at an exhibition that the kids really enjoyed that we did um, with our intermezzo wins. Do you think that your uh, time as an oboe player has helped you be a conductor? I, I think so, I think. And again, just because I did so much conducting. Now, always when I was teaching school, I was always on the elementary level. So I wasn't into big time conducting. It was mostly... Or it was just very um, basic, but uh, with the intermezzo wins, I had to be a little more because those were older older students and more advanced music students. How do parents or anybody listening to this get into those programs? What where, where can they go? How you know how do they get their children involved? Next gen youth music. Uh, Google it, and there's um, where you can sign up for the intermezzo wins. There's also intermezzo strings. There's a beginner string group, and then, of course, there's Overture and Allegretto. Those are all the different youth symphonies that are in this area. That's a lot of symphonies. It <laughs> is. So now, much. if they're for the older groups, the Overture and the Allegretto, that's the high, for the high school kids. There you have to audition. But for the intermezzo winds and strings, um, sign up. Just to sign up and a teacher recommendation. But other than that, um, yeah, you just sign up for it, and they'd, they'd love to have more performers. Oh. Is there anything, any other advice that you'd love to give to uh, any aspiring, aspiring musicians? Um, just have fun with it. It was so much fun. I often think that that guy who told me, oh, you should just major in music because you're going to spend so much time in the music building, you should major in music, not minor. And I often think, yes, I'm so glad he said that because it was so much fun. I've played with, not just playing with the big names, but just playing with other people. It's just such a, a wonderful experience. And what a what a social builder uh especially and what a what a uh, character builder especially. Oh, yes. And my students, my private oboe students that I teach at home um they'll sometimes think, "Well, I don't want to be in marching band because as an oboist, you don't play oboe in marching band. Well, Oboes play, and bassoons yeah. don't march. So they'll have to pick another instrument or play in the percussion section." And well, I don't know if I I said play. Marching band is so much fun. And just, you're right, a character builder, music builder. Um, I said you should play in that marching band. You make friends, and it's just a social thing. And I'll, I'll even say, uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, oftentimes, oboes and bassoonists don't march. My, my mother marched in, mar marched bassoon. And, and did marched, she? She oh did. Yeah, she did march bassoon. Oh, my gosh. And even I, I marched a glockenspiel. Uh, oh. I wasn't in the pit, but I actually marched Glockenspiel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so even even then, I, 
my marching band had a violinist in it. They marched the violin. Wow. <laughs> right. Uh, well, because, you know, he played violin and wanted a spot in the oh. marching band. So. Well, good for him that they let him in. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, even, even if uh, you, you're not supposed to march it, it, if you know, people will make room. Right, right. And it's gonna, you're going to enjoy marching bands so much more. Uh, first off, it's exercise. Second off, it's it is, it's such a camaraderie. You get right. you get a community of people who are, uh, most like minded. They're a bunch of kids. Or you're gonna have fun. Uh, granted, band camp is is a lot. Yeah, especially in the heat. Especially yeah. in the heat. Um, but it it really is character building. I, I wouldn't be the person I am today without a marching band because I wouldn't have the stamina. I wouldn't have the 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 tolerance <laughs> right right i wouldn't have the patience it's it's great both of my children uh performed all through high school and then when they went to college my son went to penn state and he played in the bands at penn state the whole time he was there just loved it even though he wasn't a music major um mm. and my daughter the same way played her cello and sang at her undergrad school too even though she wasn't a music major so I think that's great that the colleges have those opportunities. Yeah, and even if you're if you even if you consider yourself as a hobbyist or I'm not that good at that, do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, cuz I mean, first off, if you want to get better, that's how you do get better. Right, right. So second off, the music isn't supposed to be played for uh professionality or is it is it supposed to be played solely to make money or solely uh, it's it's a passion. Yeah. It, that's first and foremost. It's a passion, and granted, if you're a professional, then yeah, you have to worry about getting paid and all that jazz. But it, right. if if it's just a hobby, let it be a hobby. Don't don't let the the oh, but that's a professional music scene. Don't let that get in the way of no. you. Uh, play, just play. Audition. If yes. you get in, you get Great. in. If you don't, like I said, for you, it's just a passion, a hobby. Yeah. You don't don't let these uh. Don't let it be. Oh, but that's the Lancaster Symphony Orchestra. Like, don't let don't let the name right. get in the way of 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 your passion. Yeah, and audition. Try to get it. Also, there's many local bands. You know, New Holland Band and all those. They're wonderful organizations that accept people that aren't weren't ma- music majors, but were right, that want to play. Yeah. And there's a, a million and five gigging musicians that will definitely, especially here in Lancaster, where where the music scene is, uh, the gigging music scene is so diverse. People are, are always looking for like double bass players or right. or sax players or, or flute players. Just to s- even go out to an open mic, sit in sit sit in with somebody. Yeah, because they're, they're always playing, you know, cover songs that you know require or should require uh, some of these ex- quote unquote accessory instruments. Right. Um, and you're just gonna have a lot of fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's just yeah, I just made the best decision by majoring in music and continuing. To perform, you know, even because some teachers, you know, I think they spend so much time teaching, it's hard for them to add on to their schedule. But I'm so glad I did. How do you not get burned out? Has that ever ever, ever been a problem for you? <laughs> not really. Uh, but like I said, as I got older and things, when I retired from teaching, then I kind of retired from some of the the bigger things that I was playing in the symphonies and things. Then it was time for me just to, um, you know, slow down maybe a little there. So, well. This has been a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. You can find her at the Allegro concert tomorrow. And her quintet is performing in Lancaster Square, right across from the Marriott, where the statue is, on next Friday. Next Friday the 19th. At what time? 12. 12 12. 12 to 1. Noon? Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you've got coming up? Uh, That's it. I'm actually, well, no, I'm fine. That's... (laughs) I actually am, have been asked to sub in the Lebanon um, Percy Band. Hmm. Um, so that's also next weekend, and they're playing at Lidditz Park. So if you want to hear a band, and a good band, professional band, um, it's concert band, mm-hmm. um, in Lidditz Park, that's next Saturday. I'm not next sure Saturday. what time that is yet. Well, hey, if you have enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, share. You can follow us at the story uh, Corey Rosen at C O R Y R O S E N. Tomorrow we're going to be having a group from New Jersey.
called Real Fake Flowers. They, they've they been performing around here. They perform up in New Jersey. We're going to be having them on tomorrow. And then also tomorrow going live is my interview with Catherine Britt and, uh, and a very highly achieved uh, musician from Australia. She's coming here to tell us 360 August 21st at 6 o'clock. So be sure to tune in tomorrow for those two. And I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.